Welcome to Coming from Left Field, where we have conversations about politics, books, and current events with your host, Greg Gottles and Pat Cummings. In 1954, Brown versus Board of Education mandated that public schools be integrated. In Nashville, Tennessee, white supremacists were not keen on complying. So, in 1957, an elementary school was bombed. In 1958, a Jewish community center was bombed. In 1960, the home of a civil rights lawyer was bombed. Frankly, the police and FBI seemed to do a shoddy job investigating these bombings. But recently, a local author and historian decided to write about these crimes. And a month ago, the cases have been reopened. This is a good story. Let's discuss. We are so glad to have Betsy Phillips on our podcast today, coming from left field. Betsy, we've been just following your progress with your new your book, uh, Dynamite Nashville. And uh, it's a book called, uh, the subtitle is Unmasking the FBI, the KKK, and the Bombers Beyond Their Control. And you are a historian and an author in Nashville, Tennessee. And a while back, you started to investigate old 1960 bombings that were uh, uh, as a result of the Brown versus Board of Education uh, right. in Nashville, Tennessee. And tell us about this story. Right. So I, um, I started this the summer of 2017, which was about to be the 60th anniversary of school desegregation here in Nashville, or public school desegregation. And so I thought that, you know, now's the time, let's just say who blew up the Hattie Cotton Elementary School the weekend that school desegregated. And I assumed that it would be like it is I don't know if you how familiar you guys are with Birmingham, but in Birmingham, you could go down and ask anybody about any of those bombings and everybody knows who did it. Like they might not have been able to get justice for everything, but like there's a small group of guys and people pretty much know. So I assumed that that's how it would be here, but I started asking around and asking around and I just wasn't finding the right like gossip circles and then I finally I got a hold of the FBI file for the Hattie Cotton bombing. And I realized that the FBI realized, I mean, it's right there in the file, that the FBI had withheld witnesses from the National Police and also, in at least one case, backdated a memo so that it looked like they'd given the police information about these bombing or that bombing in particular before it happened when really they had not until after it happened. So that's when I was like, oh, this, this is bigger. This isn't just like some, you know, small independent group of the KKK blowing up a school because what that shouldn't involve the FBI misleading the Nashville police. Right. Like, right. So that's what got me started down this rabbit hole because then I, you know, started asking myself, like, well, why did they stop bombing things? Like the actual the Hattie Cotton bombing was pretty successful. The school was closed. Um, integration was almost derailed. And I think like if they had had another successful school attack, that would have been the end of it. Um so I just was like, this it's weird. You don't see, especially like among, you know, racial terrorists, there, there's not a lot of like, oh, okay, this went well, let's never do it again. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, and so that's when I found these other bombings and then also began to see how they were connected right. to bombings throughout the South. Good. Let's go, let's go back and put this in a little better perspective. In 1954, Brown versus Board of Education demanded the you know, desegregation of schools. And the South was slow and sometimes quite oppositional to that. So that's 54. Right. So then there were, in relationship to these desegregation efforts in Nashville, mm -hmm. there were three, three 
bombings that occurred. There was the Hattie Cotton School in 1957, which was an elementary school. Yes. The other schools were in the process of being desegregated. This was bomb. Uh, a year later, there was the Nashville Jewish Community Center was bombed, yes. also related to you know desegregation right. and so forth. And then one year later, in 1960, there was a very leading civil rights attorney, uh, Z. Alexander Lottie, right? Luby. Luby. L yes. Luby. And his home was bombed. Yes. And if you look at the, I did what you did, you know, this is back in 1960. We didn't have Google. It's pretty right. easy to look at what, what, ha what we have here. If you go to Wikipedia, synagogue bombings, there were bombings all over the place. In, yeah. There were there were like six or seven synagogue bombings uh, in a period of just a, a you know a couple of years. Yeah, that about was eighteen months. All, all related to this. Yep. It, and if you look at some of them, it was the con, it was the Confederate. Um, uh, what was the name of the organization? Underground. Pardon yeah. me. Underground. Yeah, the Confederate Underground. The Confederate Underground was calling in and saying, we're bombing synagogues. Yes, yes, so, exactly. So in light of that, all of these bombings in Nashville were just, you know, it's like, we don't know what happened. So right. you right. you decide, because you're a historian, and a very good one, I mean, you know, very footnoted, you, you cross your... T's dot your eyes. Well, you, I wanted whoever came after me to be able to, you know, pick up the pick up the baton. Yeah. yeah, exactly. So that's where you start to say, "Wait a second, I'm going to really do a deep dive because I you love Nashville, it's your community, and you right. and you started to investigate this." Right. Yes. So that's the background, right? Yes. Right. And you found all kinds of skeletons yes <laughs> the, tell, tell us about the tell us about the police at the time in nashville what were the police like in 1960s in nashville oh right so um terrible like just it's hard to overstate just like here's an example <laughs> if you're if we're talking just to give your listeners a hint there was there were four Klan members that were arrested for the Hattie Cotton bombing. The Nashville police had decided that they were going to frame them for this bombing so that they could, you know, get the case out of the public eye. One of those guys, so this is a Klansman who at least made a good patsy. He saw the Nashville police kill a Black inmate. And he was the only person in that jail willing to testify against them. So that's the kind of like terrible, like, yeah, when, when your actions are so egregious that a Klansman who has reason to be suspected of racial terrorism is like, oh, I'm sorry, that's too far what you did to that guy. Like, you know, you're over the line. So yeah, so they were regularly beating people they tried to beat confessions out of these guys that they were trying to frame so on the one hand i could appreciate why the fbi wasn't eager to turn over witnesses to the police because you know who knows what's going to happen to them once they get into the police's custody um but on the other hand the police were actually very anxious to solve these crimes because a misstep that these terrorists had made was since the little girl, Patricia Watson, her parents had not pre-registered her for school. So no one knew she was going to be there until she showed up the first day of school. So when Nashville woke up that next day to learn that Hattie Cotton School had been bombed, they thought a an all-white elementary school had been bombed. And they were you just imagine like it had never occurred to white Nashville, you know, they thought like, well, that, that civil rights stuff, that desegregation stuff, that doesn't have anything to do with me. I'm either on the side of the segregationist or I have no opinion. So it shouldn't affect me at all. 
And so for them to realize like, no, this, this could harm any of us at any time. And our, you know, desire to stay out of it isn't going to spare our children was really shocking. So there was a ton of pressure on the Nashville police to actually genuinely solve this. Um, so, you know, not having that information from the FBI or, or for that matter, the FBI not solving it when they could have, you know, was just a real missed opportunity. Now you're a historian, so you know how to dig and uh, to do these things. We have to look back in 1960, no, no Google, right? <laughs> that's, that's stupid, but right. they even to communicate with other police departments yes. uh, was long distance calls. They weren't very, very good about this. No, and they were expensive. Like I, I even, I found one memo between Miami and Jacksonville, Florida, where they were fairly sure that their bombings of synagogues, or I think it was a JCC and a synagogue were related, but Jacksonville couldn't get budget clearance to make phone calls to Miami to try to like, get this settled yeah and and here's a new york here's a new york times article and it's a jewish center bombed in the south jacksonville negro school also hit in blast laid to an underground they clearly state that yes we are the confederate underground and we did this yeah and yet they didn't they didn't seem to have the ability to make the connection that there was a very active KKK terror group right. operating all through the South and specifically in your in your right. city, right. Yeah. and that when when you just started to do just simple searches, putting together old clippings and so forth, right. Right. you saw these patterns just jump out at you and just just you know, oh, right. Prominently. I mean, I Right. To me, this was one of the like more disturbing parts is because, you know, like, yes, I had very many advantages that, you know, obviously they didn't have in 1960, but someone in tried to kill a Nashville politician like Z. Alexander Luby was a famous civil rights lawyer, but he was also a sitting city councilman. And nobody before me ever tried to figure out who tried to kill him. So like, yeah, it, it would have been very difficult to maybe put all these things together in 1960, but by 1980 or by 1990 or even 2000, back when people were still alive and could have been held accountable, it was possible. And it's certainly like a lot of my research suggested that as much as the FBI was saying outward that these bombings are not connected, it's clear that like Southern states had put together like, wait, these are all the same guys. This, we should get, you know, we should try to do something about it, but without the aid of the FBI, without somebody who could run like a region wide investigation, it kind of didn't matter that everybody knew. And, and he was buddies with, with King. Yeah. yeah, they were friends. They were. I mean, he was. A, he's a prominent mm -hmm. civil rights yeah. attorney. Yeah, and uh, had a lot of. And you kind of are drawing some lines to say that that maybe all of this going on in Nashville somehow ended up down in Memphis. That ended oh, up, I, uh, I feel very confident that I mean, and I'm not going out on a limb here by saying this. Like King's family doesn't believe that we've gotten the full story of what happened in his assassination. Um, but I think that part of the reason that we haven't gotten that full story is because people don't know about this part of the history. The fact that like, you know, that J.B. Stoner was gunning for King in 1958. He was offering to kill King in 58. Talk, talk about Stoner. Tell, tell right. us about so Stoner. J.B. Stoner was I just call him a straight up Nazi. I think calling him a neo-Nazi um, erases, like he was pen pals with Lord Haw Haw, for those of you who are like Nazi propaganda stands. <laughs> Lord Haw Haw was a 
I think he either an American or British guy, but who had moved to Nazi Germany to support the Nazi effort. And he and Stoner were pen pals when Stoner was in high school. Stoner rechartered the Klan in Chattanooga also when he was in high school. And then um, he got kicked out of the Klan twice for being too anti-Semitic. And um, how, 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 how is that possible? <laughs> This was an interesting thing that I learned, right? That there, that anti-Semites in the South had actually kind of a problem because like twofold. One was that a lot of Southern whites weren't that familiar with, with what Jew, what a Jew even was. So like, it kind of didn't matter. Like you could say like, oh, Jews are terrible and they're taking over the world. But since, you know, they didn't know what a Jewish person looked like or how to discern who was one that was problem a but problem b was that before like 57 58 when you start to see a changing of, of the guard in who clan leadership is the clan was led by world war ii vets and world war ii vets did not want to be associated with nazis right anything that seemed like it was too close to what the nazis were up to considering the Nazis had, you know, shot at their friends and them and killed some of their friends. So the these anti-Semites actually really benefited from the Red Scare because they were able to change the dynamic of the conversation. Now going after Jews, which they were linking with communism, right? That's instead of being the anti-American stance because you're taking the side of the Nazis, they had turned it into, well, this is the pro-American stance because you're siding against the communist. But like John Casper got ran out of a community in North Carolina by the KKK because they didn't want him bothering their Jews. So, you know, there it was this like really strange moment before like the anti-Semitism and the anti-Black racism became so strongly linked when you saw these like vile characters really struggling to get anti-Semitism into the KKK. So that was kind of Stoner's goal in life was to make sure that anti-Black and uh, anti-Jewish racism were linked. Let's come back to Stoner. It's been 15 minutes and Greg hasn't said anything. Greg, she's just making this stuff up. You got yeah. the, the, you can't this is just too crazy to even think this is true, right? Is that what you're thinking? Is that what's it's, going through your mind? I'm thinking I'm thinking what a great antidote this is to the Mississippi burning paradigm. Oh, you know, right. the idea that most people have uh, how the FBI operates. And when you go back to uh, something that Betsy said earlier about, you know, how difficult it is to get information and pass it on and not having Google but the instrument for that was supposed to be the FBI. It was supposed to be the National Intelligence Agency. It would link police departments up with information. They have their fingerprint uh, whole industry where they keep all the fingerprints. And so yeah, they, we know that story. But it clashes with the way they really operated in the right. South in particular. Mississippi burning is just a total lie. I mean, it, it just gives the wrong. But that's probably what most people believe. And the great thing about this book is that it begins to undercut that picture based on facts, based on a reality that uh, that you investigated. I, I find the most interesting things are the structural things that you point to. For example, the Confederate underground. I mean, there's there is a uh, there's an institution here. It's right. not just as Mississippi Burning depicts it, a bunch of good old boys, you know, yeah. to get out of line. It's an institution. And then you talk about the League of the South and these intellectuals at Vanderbilt. Mm -hmm. And Robert Penn Warren was one of them. And I mean, he's a pretty famous uh, figure nationally. Right. And, and he and did so, somewhat repent later on. But during the time I'm talking about, you know, he was supposed to be the like more progressive of the group. And <laughs> the stuff he was writing then was very racist. <laughs> you know, he he did mellow some, but like, when you look at Robert Penn Warren's writings from this time and you realize like he's the least racist of the fugitives and the agrarians, it's pretty appalling. 
Oh and you God. allude to this funding mechanism, which I think is also a contribution. Can you explain that you, you since there's a funding mechanism that's created yes. by the institutions? Right, right. So this actually goes back to the this poet, Donald Davidson, who was a member of the Fugitives and the Agrarians. And then he started this group, um, the Tennesseans for Constitutional Government. And it was supposed to be like a bunch of like, intellectual rich racist not a bunch like a select few and they would get together you know and discuss like how to promote racism but what they would do and they did this through the figure of jack kershaw now jack kershaw in nashville is mostly known as being we used to have this really hideous sculpture of nathan bedford forrest that sat along the interstate out south of town and he was the guy who sculpted that but he is also one of the founders of the League of the South, and he was back in this group with Donald Davidson. And so what Davidson would do is he and his group would take all their money, you know, or not all their money, but they would collect money from other rich white sympathizers. And then they would use that to like bail Klansmen out of jail when they got arrested. Um, they would, you know, send like if you needed money for i don't know flyers or something like they were basically it was a way for rich racists to support poor racists without having to reveal themselves as being you know like violent and in the trenches with these racists so when jack kershaw goes on to f to found the league of the south which much like the sons of confederate veterans is passing itself off as like here's just some eccentrics with views that we disagree with but like what's the worst that can happen they're just going to go out on weekends and pretend shoot at each other you know um but actually the league of the south was again this mechanism for raising funds that then could be funneled towards more violent racist and the League of the South was like one of the major funding mechanisms behind the Charlottesville incident. What do we call that? An incident, a tragedy, um, the Unite the Right. Like, so this funding mechanism that was developed in Nashville to allow rich racists to participate without having to like sully their reputations, Kershaw brought that right into the present and it killed Heather Heyer. So, you know, these things that I'm seeing happening in Nashville in the 50s and 60s, like, to realize, like, there is a direct, unbroken connection between that time here and what is still happening, like, out in the world. Well, you, really... you, you're, you're talking about the 50s and 60s. How about this? September 1st, New York Times. What can a city do when neo-Nazis start marching in down mm -hmm. down its streets? That's about Nashville. Yeah, that's an article that was just a couple of days ago. Yeah. Um. And by the way, in that article, they absolutely praise your book and your scholarship. And I, you know, I don't. You're going to get a big head if I keep. Talking. <laughs> I, I, it I gotta, I gotta calm down a little bit. You're not that. You're not all that. You're not all yeah, that. You're right. Exactly. But okay. Here, here, here's a here's another thing. Well, look, I, I want to get back to B.F. Stoner, but uh, the, it's mandated by Congress that the FBI release the JFK files every, mm -hmm. you know, right. 50 right. years or something like that. And so that came with Trump. And of course, they still sandbag and don't release the anything. But you found that when Trump's uh, administration released some of the files, they inadvertently released some information yeah. regarding the FBI's ties to what was going on in 1960 with all of this. Yeah, it this was stuff. really very upsetting um, because what happened was they released parts of the Martin Luther King file that they weren't supposed to release, but it was in there in the JFK stuff. And, you know, thank goodness for conspiracy theorists because they immediately, you know, leaped on those files and went through them and that's how it was discovered like oh hey crap there's this stuff in there and those files 
show J. Edgar Hoover just straight up bragging that the FBI was running the Klan in Tennessee. Now, he makes that brag in 65, but I think judging by like when he, because he says that they took over the Klan in order to make it less violent, to steer it towards less violent activities, which I believe like if you think of Memphis in 68, we may have some doubts about how less violent that really ended up. But um, based on you know him saying there had been a riot, the governor had had to call in the National Guard, and that's when they decided they needed to take over the Klan. And uh, the other historians who came across this thought that that meant like 63 or 64, but I think based on what I saw, because something happened in 57 that caused the Tennessee clan to split. And I think that that was that the FBI came in, took over, and then we're like, okay, we're not going to be violent or we're going to be less violent. Uh, so all of the violent extremists were like, okay, fine, then we're not going to be in the Klan. We're going to go start our own Klan where we can do what we want. So my guess is that it actually happened much earlier. And to me, that explains why they couldn't let these crimes be solved. Because if they had as an asset the head of the Klan in Tennessee and no violent not you couldn't kill somebody or try to kill somebody without the approval of the head of the clan so if it came out that they were controlling the clan at the time of the luby bombing then either they would have to admit like hey we knew this was going to happen and we let it happen or they're bragging about their great clan connections was was bs like it just can't be like either you have these great you know informants which means you certainly should have known this plot was afoot or you didn't so like one of the conclusions that i come to is that either way either way they failed at their job i'm not sure i'm not sure they fail i mean i think <laughs> Hoover was a uh, a character. He was yeah. he was different, and you know when it when when it was important for him to look make the FBI look good, like in the '30s with gang wars and stuff like that. He right. wanted to look as though his guys were out there apprehending and fighting and shooting and shooting it out with the bad guys. When it came to uh, overseeing the, the right wing, when doing the right wing, he insisted that we are the Federal Bureau of Investigation. Mm -hmm. We don't do anything. We we're not we're not we, we're not charged with acting. We're supposed to investigate, take the information back to the proper authorities. And so he always wanted to be clean like that when it yeah. came to racial stuff. Because look, the the FBI was all white up until I don't know when, but well into yeah. the fifties and into the sixties. It was very conservative. They recruited out of Notre Dame. They recruited mm -hmm. uh, very conservative people by design, and so they weren't they weren't for integration. They just weren't. Yeah, but exactly. they couldn't they couldn't they couldn't participate. I don't think. I mean, I agree. I think what you said is very insightful. They really w didn't want to see the violence because it would embarrass them. They couldn't participate, but they could they could allow a certain level of this resistance to integration to occur. And they were happy to do it. I think that's your research and others' research show that. That's consistent right. with the FBI. Right. They operate. right. And I, I think, like, too, one of the things that comes across in the MLK papers that got released, the, which it's not the whole file, obviously, but this partial file, is, I, I mean, I, I knew that Hoover had it in for King. But until reading through these files and just seeing, I mean, because this is what Hoover kept, right? So like, who knows? But just reading through those files, you're like, wow, this man is obsessed and deranged. Like, yeah. I don't know what 
exactly it was about King that triggered Hoover, for lack of a better word, but like he could not, could not stand down. Even like when the Justice Department told him like, this is going to blow up in our faces, you have to leave King alone. When, you know, like the president was like, dude, back off. He just couldn't do it. He could not let it be. So realizing that like made me see too that it's like oh right so like he wasn't in a place where he could like actually give fair and clean directives about what to do because he really was experiencing these black activists king especially as enemies of the united states so once you see somebody that way what do you care if they die like the clan is then doing you a favor but it's really, it's really depressing. And I've had to like eat a lot of crow with some of my dad's old friends who are black pastors because I used to roll my eyes when I was younger because they would get together and talk about the old days and they'd be like, you just don't know the, the FBI this, the FBI that. And I'd roll my eyes like, oh gosh, here they go again. And now I'm like, they were right. They were right. They were right all along. And like, it was even worse than they said out loud, right. you know, in my presence. Well, I read the book on, um, on him. Uh, is it G man? The book yeah. on, yeah. Uh, he, he, he had kind of a screwed up love map, um, you know, yeah. with his own sexuality, I, but just imagine how weird it is to sit around and, and perseveratively replay sex tapes of, you know, King with his li right. liaisons. And I, you know, so there, there was something, like you said, there was something there that was hitting a right, right. a fetish well, nerve or something. In, I don't know. Right. It's like, strange. And one of the, the weird things in the file was like you could tell he like apparently he had recorded King and Coretta having a fight about some of King's infidelities, and King was like, You you should also go blow steam off this way. Like it's fine, right? And I think like, oh man, if if they had been in a more modern paradigm, we would just be like, oh, they had an open marriage. Like it right. just wouldn't seem, you know, like as big a deal. But Hoover seemed like, like he just could not believe, A, that Coretta wasn't like more angry and B, that King would encourage her to also like try it like it, it was incomprehensible to him right right did they have pool boys back then i don't know or that was only the <laughs> gram fund anyway that's that's bad all right okay you got to get back to stoner jb stoner because had the had the fbi done their job yes. we might have not lost king so he he yeah. is a central casting terrorist consultant. Yes. Who yes. who goes on to become an attorney, right? Yes. Yes. To defend all of these. Yeah. So he could that, he could okay. show up in your town, teach you to build a bomb, give you a if you didn't have anybody in your clan who was willing to plant the bomb as long as you had somebody willing to drive, he could give you a bomber. And then if y'all got caught, he could show up and defend you. Like Grubhub, he would give you a bomber that, oh, I got a bomber yeah. for you. Just oh. Right. And once you realize that that's how he acted, and then you start to flip through a history of the 50s and 60s, and you see how many times his name pops up, it's, it's really frightening. Like, I, I mentioned this in the book, but, you know, like, he was in Birmingham before the 16th Street Baptist Church bombing, and it is widely, widely believed that he helped bring the dynamite into town and may have even been running bomb building classes before that happened. So for me, one of the just hardest parts about writing this book is like once I understood that that's what people in Birmingham believed, that that's the story that, you know, that he was 
you know, he wasn't one of the bombers directly, but they believed the bombing happened because of his help. So as I'm writing, I realize like there's four dead children at the end of all this. Like, so it was really harrowing to write because you're like, you're seeing all of these things happen where people can't set their pettiness aside or they've got these different agendas that go all this way. And they don't realize, obviously, because it's just, you know, it hasn't happened yet. But I realized as the historian writing about it that like all of these decisions that they're making to leave J.B. Stoner out in the world is going to cost people their lives starting with those four girls in Birmingham and I think pretty clearly through King. And and, it, and they would, when you looked at the police, they'd say, well, he couldn't have been involved because he wasn't in the city. Well, he never mm -hmm. was in the city. That was yeah. what he did. He, exactly he, was a, right. he wouldn't, you know, he would yeah. kind of come in, set things up and then I'll yeah. see you. And, uh, you know, and yeah, yeah. Unreal, I think unreal. Yeah. Because he came so close to being caught by Bull Connor that he changed how he operated in response to that. So, like, <laughs> the one... draw a line between J.B. Stoner and the, and the King assassination. Okay. Right, right. So, obviously, um, there's a couple of things. There is one, there is a rumor that I think it should be looked into. J.B. Stoner's best friend slash maybe life partner, Ed Fields, sold a gun. Wait, life partner, meaning like J. Edgar Hoover's life partner? Yeah. They, they were male relationship. Yes. Yeah. Okay. At least they every time they were together, they shared a bed. And that was like widely known. Um, but Ed Fields, I think Ed slept with anybody, like of any, you know, Ed probably had to be pulled off a tree a time or two. <laughs> but, mm -hmm. um, I have friends so that like that. Ed Fields allegedly sold a rifle to James Earl Ray of the exact type that James Earl Ray then used to shoot King. That hasn't been verified, but that it that seems very plausible. And then um after King was assassinated, J.B. Stoner was in Jackson, Mississippi, which is just not that far from Memphis. It's just really not that far from Memphis. And FBI informants reported that before they knew, like right, it had that King's assassination had not hit the airwaves yet. The phone rang, Stoner picked it up, and he said, oh, so he's finally a good N-word then. And meaning dead, up. meaning dead. Right. Yeah. Yeah, because they have, a, they're saying that the only good N-word is a dead N-word. Um, and then he was one of James Earl Ray's attorneys. And James Earl Ray's brother was for a while his chauffeur slash bodyguard. So he is closely tied in with the Rays and clearly like in the loop, like somebody in Memphis knew to call him to tell him that the assassination had happened. So, you know, again, like this idea that somehow Stoner wasn't involved is just ludicrous to me because you know, like, I am not involved in, like, the Tennessee Titans game. So, like, they're never going to call me, right? <laughs> like, once you start getting phone calls and then you're, at, like, brought on as a lawyer, I don't know, man. I, I start to think, like, that is some kind of involvement that needs to be looked at more closely. Yeah. All right, Betsy, you're kind of like... um Michelle uh, McNamara and I'll Be Gone in the Dark. Oh my you know gosh, that thank you. That's you know, what a okay. compliment. Well, I, it is, and I'm making that. And that is, the, the she was a crime detective married to... Uh, Pat Oswalt. Yeah. Uh, Oswalt. And she just tenaciously, tenaciously was investigating these crimes, getting on online blogs, 
you started this in 2017, right? Yeah. So you did the same thing. And just putting in, you know, you keep writing articles about this. You keep doing things. And lo and behold, a month ago, the mayor of Nashville said, yeah. because of you, because, yeah. because of your book, because of all of the footwork that you have done in investigating this, this is a bunch of this is a bunch of who we, we've got to reopen yeah. these cases. We need to have an active investigation. This is this is a shame that we have allowed this to go so many years with no resolution. And good for him. He hired a pretty he appointed a pretty good detective. Yes. Uh, have you met with this detective? I have. I have. I've met with him. Um, he is what I believe um, to be the right amount of skeptical. I was a little, I know this is going to seem strange, but I was a little worried that he might be too gung ho. But like the reason that I didn't, wasn't able to solve these cases to my satisfaction, you know, they are more solved than they have ever been. But um. The police files from that era are all missing. Nashville has no police files back before 1963. Intentionally? Uh, apparently. Apparently when we switched from a city government to a metropolitan government, the Nashville police took that moment to just... Purge the racism. Yeah. It's pretty pretty daunting when you need to like... <laughs> so I knew that was going to be a big problem. The FBI remains uncooperative, so that's, you know, another big hurdle, and so many people are dead. So I I'm very glad he is just one of the best cold case detectives that Nashville has, very tenacious, you know, he'll, he'll stick with stuff, he will, like, I... I heard just really glowing stories from him from a couple of prosecutors about how he goes above and beyond to try to like make sure he has the truth but i also know you know we're talking 60 years ago no police files people are dead that's going to be difficult so i was glad that he seemed to have like what i would call kind of like a a reasonable amount of pessimism about like what he might be able to find on the other hand he will be able to get the cooperation of other police departments throughout the South. Like anybody who had a Confederate underground bombing, right? He could just email them or right. even call them long distance. That That's right. not going to be the same. And I found, I don't want to inadvertently be like too praising of Bull Connor, but I found a ton of Nashville Police Department files down in Bull Connor's file because he kept everything. So that was ended up being, you know, really helpful. And I guess the one good thing Bull Connor ever did. <laughs> I don't know. Right, right. But you know, but so like those kinds of things will be, I think, more available to him. Um the other thing that I think may happen is I know like with the Luby bombing, there were witnesses who saw a car with two white guys in it. Um, and they were not taken seriously by the police, um, especially like one guy at, at the time, he was a student, he was a high school student, and he wrote down the license plate and the police dismissed him as being like developmentally challenged. And I was like, or he was a black kid and two white cops came up with the reputation that cops in Nashville had yeah, yeah. and he was afraid, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. but the license plate that he gave them, because one of the reasons that according to what I found, you know, was that they dismissed him was that the license plate didn't match the car. But what I found is that that license plate, belonged to a guy who lived two blocks away from the clan headquarters. Oh God. So I think they just came down, borrowed his license plate. He may not have even known, you know, like his car's out in front of the house. But if they had actually like to track that lead down, 
they would have realized like oh this puts this car you know this license plate two blocks from the clan and this kid puts this license plate at the bombing hmm let, let's draw a line there but but they never did but that kid would be my dad's age now so people so, are still around yeah so he he could still be alive and you know that was one of the things that really struck me when i started this is so nashville desegregated in a stair step so like that first year 1957 it was only first grade so when they asked those kid those people to come back who had been first graders in 1957 about half of them brought their parents and that really struck me as like wow so it's not like on the one hand yes we are losing a lot of our like what better known civil rights icons but on the other hand like the parents who made the decision to bring their kids into these schools and integrate them half of those parents are still around or at least were in 2017 like that's how recent this past is those six-year-olds again younger than my parents who are still alive like so if, to me that's another reason like that leaving this unsolved as if like oh it was so long ago like no it wasn't people are there people are here like those first graders are still with us well, it's a small story. I'm an Air Force brat. And then uh, 1960, we moved from England to some uh, to Murfreesboro, Tennessee. Oh, okay. And I lived in Readyville in a little farm out in Readyville. Mm -hmm. Went to St. Rosa Lima and with my sister until she got kicked out of the Catholic Church. And then went to Middle Tennessee State College Training School, which it was state college then, it's university. Yes. And when we lived out in the country, I just, I'll just, this is kind of a short story, but when we lived in the country in Rutherford, I would, uh, I was 12, I would go to visit my neighbor who was a 21 year old man who had cerebral palsy. He literally was in a wheelchair and a very bright guy. And I would build airplane models with him. I would be his hands and he would read me the directions. And his father was a high school English teacher at Smyrna High School and was a very classy, Southern intellectual, mm -hmm. come home, have a pipe. He would just, he was just a brilliant right. guy. One time I went over to his house. I had never seen somebody so rage filled in my life. It was inward this inward that just going crazy because someone some young woman had the audacity to come and want to go to Smyrna high school right. and integrate right. it and had to have the police all around had to have the no, national guard not oh, the police course, yeah. the national guard because the yeah. police didn't give a hooey right exactly. so the level of white rage the level of opposition to just having kids come to school was i as a as a fourth grader I, it was palatable it was just right, it right. was crazy yeah and and it's um so i could see how this would be just sort of swept under and not really dealt with and kind of you know the whole power structure of everybody there Education, police, government was all white yeah. Southern men. Yeah, very, primarily. very much so. Very and much they so. weren't very woke back in the No, for sure not. 60s, for right? sure not. But, right? you know, like I said, though, I think there was a unique opportunity because Nashville thought that that elementary school was all white. And then the bombing of the Jewish Community Center, they certainly, like, Nashville did not think of there wasn't that link of like oh jews and black people that that wasn't as like prevalent in nashville so there was community support for solving these bombings because white people thought oh no we're targets right <laughs> like, oh okay yeah so um that that kind of opened a window of opportunity and it is a, a real shame that it wasn't taken because that would have then obviously like saved more people a lot of heartache.
Any final thoughts, uh, Greg? Who's going to play? Um, who's going to play Betsy Phillips in the movie when this? Uh, when <laughs> I would think I'd say a young Kathy need, Bates would be great, like in Misery or we, something we like need, that. We need that movie more than we need Mississippi Burning. But you know, it wasn't just the South. Uh, we shouldn't give the impression that in the fifties it was just the South that was backward in terms of racial justice. Or in general, the whole country was backward. It was a time of McCarthyism and, and extreme racism as an embarrassment to to the governing people because we were in the Cold War and we were more segregated here in mm -hmm. South Africa in many cases, right. and certainly in the South and in the North too. I mean, I grew up in a small town in Illinois and across the border in Indiana. My American history teacher would tell all of us tales of her boyfriend taking her across the border for lynchings. You know, this would have been in the 60s in, in Illinois. Right. And, uh, you know, there was uh, intimidation of white people. I mean, it, it, the, the impression that all white people were racist is mistaken. There are plenty of races, but there was an intimidation factor, too, because it oh, became yeah. a dominant cultural way. And, and people were afraid to bucket. They're afraid to say, uh, my senior year, I wrote an edit editorial for our uh, high school paper about another country, which was a James Baldwin novel. This is the 100th anniversary of James Baldwin's birth. And it won a competition in Terre Haute, Indiana, but my teachers wouldn't say that. They said, well, we submitted several of them and it could have been that one, but it may have been another one. And because it was too much pressure and it was so racially charged, yeah. they couldn't come out and, and, and endorse what I had written. Mm -hmm. So, you know, it, it's, it's, we're fortunate. We don't know how far we've come, but we don't know how far we have to go either. And I think what Betsy's doing is going to hopefully move us further forward and get to the bottom of some of this. Well, you've got to be just tickled pink that uh, all of your hard work is coming to uh, maybe make some changes and maybe uh, write history a little more accurately and uh, make things better for us uh, right now. So. Well, thank you all so much. I, I hope that that's true. Uh, this is already beyond, I think, what any historian mm -hmm. could mm -hmm. ever have hoped for. This is just, you know, just more than I could have hoped for. And I, whenever people are like, what do you hope will come of this? And I'm like, I don't know. Like this mm -hmm. so wasn't even a possibility that like, I don't know. I'm just hopeful something, but I, I don't know yet. Yeah. Well. I just have one last question. Uh, was this a better interview than Amy Goodman's interview on Democracy Now yesterday? Or uh... listen, that was you. You, you, you guys did a good job with that. They, you did a good job, and I thought that was a great interview yesterday. I was so excited. I sent Greg a, I sent Greg an email. I said, "Oh my God, Betsy's on Democracy Now." That's how I start my morning. And <laughs> no, it was really like that is an operation. Like they, it, she was so knowledgeable. Oh goodness. She is very bright. Yeah. And then also, you know, like I could hear, you know, I'm sitting in this room, just staring at a camera. Right? Oh, you, you didn't go to, you went to a local studio. Yes. Oh, yeah. I didn't even know that. I thought you were actually there. No, oh, no, no. So I, I'm just staring at this camera with my earpiece in and I can hear like, so she I she seemed very familiar, but that she also had a producer who's like, okay, remember, this is how you pronounce the name. This is this, this is that. Like, in a way, like I felt in such good hands because it just seemed like not only was she really prepared, but this whole like organization was prepared. I mean, like they brought me into the studio, the people, you know, every, it was just, it was like we nothing I've that. experienced. We have all of that, Betsy. We have all of that. <laughs> yes, your producer is so lovely. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> but yeah. Um, well, it's this was this was a treat. Are you writing any anything else? Um, you know, I write for the scene every week. And right. that's um, the Nashville scene. It's yes, a, the Nashville and a lot. Scene. If you Google your name with Nashville scene, you'll see a lot of articles and pictures and so forth related yeah. to this incident. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. Um, and I, at the moment, am trying to, because 
I realized in doing this research, just this like a weird side, is that um, Davidson County actually had a small, what Davidson County is where Nashville is, um, had a bunch of small black villages between like 1865 and 1940, where people just like lived out their lives. They had a school, some kind of like lodge, a church, maybe two churches. Um, and because nothing like tragic or bad happened to them, we don't know about it. So I am trying to figure out like how to um, find these places and document them because it's like, you know, as I continue to stumble across this stuff, I want a place to put it because, you know, like one of the big drawbacks that I faced doing this book is that since no one else had written about these bombings before, I, I didn't have the ability to be like, oh, so-and-so said this, but I actually found out this. So one of the things I want to do is like leave a trail for whoever comes after me. So if there's someone who comes after me that's like, I wonder if there were these little villages, then at least they're like, oh, okay, Betsy started to document them. Here's some stuff she found. Mm -hmm. um, Good. So I think that's one, kind of what I'm... She, well, one of the things that I found remarkable, I, had, I mean, it really almost shocked me, was when you talked about how Nashville was not uh, segregated by housing. I mean, I was, I was shocked when I read that, that it took the interstate highway to create and gentrification to further create it. Yeah. But everything was segregated, but not the housing. That's so unusual and different. It might be an interesting book to write about what that meant. I mean, how that affected relations. Right. Well, and I, I'll say that, like, it's one of those things that even like when I talk to, you know, you can almost see the generation gap. Because when I talk to younger black nashvillians you know they're like yeah this neighborhood's a black neighborhood that neighborhood's a black neighborhood you know it always has been but when i talk to people who are like 60 and older so who lived who were adults before the interstates went through and i just ask them like okay well who all lived in your neighborhood they're like oh so and so and so and so and there was that white family on the corner and and then when you're like well did you did you consider this a black neighborhood? And they did because there were black owned businesses, but that seemed to be, so there's like a, like a generation gap where the younger people use the term black neighborhood to mean the neighborhood where majority black people live. And the older black Nashvilleians use black neighborhood to mean a place where black people could mm. own businesses. Mm -hmm. And I think that to me is a really interesting because it's a distinction that people don't even realize. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So yeah. it's been lost. But yeah, like neighborhoods were integrated and it was the interstates that segregated us. Right. But also, again, a thing we don't want to talk about because it means we segregated in the 70s. Well, I, of, like, you know, I was there. I was there in 60 to 63 and, you know, black black only water fountains white only water fountains yeah. you'd go to the greyhound bus station it'd be a beautiful bus yeah. station and there'd be just a shack in the back and yeah. that and yeah. you know this is that this is in my lifetime and that's yeah. and as a as an air force brat you're around very oh, integrated course. you know things to to come from that situation into the south at that time it was like truly a a pretty strange world oh, um right you know, well, that's like, um, I've been doing some research on the Highlander Center. And, um, you know, one of the things that Rosa Parks said about that is that's the first time that she'd ever seen a white woman do dishes. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and, the and the first time that she had ever experienced doing dishes with a white woman. And oh like, God. it's like, oh, of course, right? Like, because if you're in a situation as a black woman where dishes are being done in the South at that time, of course, the expectation is you do them. Oh, my God. Right? <laughs> so she just talked about how really freeing it was, like amazing it was to finally, like, 
get to meet and interact with white people who didn't have that like kind of just built in idea of like who does what based on what color your skin is right that, that'd make a good book the highlanders would make a the highlanders center would make a good book with the Bradens and that whole history and how it affected uh, the civil rights movement and yeah. how little it's known and of course that's the basis for some of uh J. Edgar hoover's distrust of king because king's involvement with communists in the right. at the highlander center so yeah well yeah, and actually the, the funny thing is like the reason that so the that site the high where it was in the 60s up in mont eagle um the state confiscated that i think in 62 and took it away from the highlander center so they had to move to knoxville and now they're in a town outside of knoxville um, so the state stole, stole their land up on the mountain and now they're trying to get it back, but a preservation group owns it and doesn't want to share it because they want to turn it into a museum. Mm -hmm. But the Highlander people are like, yeah, but that's our stolen land. <laughs> like, <laughs> please return it to us. So it's, it's really interesting to see like that difference between like people who, still want to use that space as a place for like organizing and education versus people who want to like turn it into a museum right which betsy so much fun i just this is such a treat to read a good book and then chat with you and i'm just, oh thank I'm you so, so much. i'm so proud that you're um uh getting some good recognition and i just hope you keep at it and it's good work i mean it's really good work what you're doing it's it's healing it's 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 very progressive. It's it's doing the right thing. So thank you for being. Well, thank you. Thank you so much. Being with us and having a discussion and uh, keep keep at it. All give, right. Keep, <laughs> give them hell. All right. Yeah. See you.